See ya. Eddie, what are your thoughts uh, what happened this weekend with Amir Khan? Um, I think that uh, it's tough for us to criticise, really, because I thought he was very brave in the fight. You know, like most people, he got heavy knockdown in the first round. But he was always trying in the fight. He was always trying to engage. He was always jumping in. He was always putting himself at risk to get knocked out. And I think I was noticing that in the corner, in the rounds previously, just every round, he just looked like he was more war-torn. And I felt like there was a very good chance that he was going to get stopped in that fight quite soon. And I think Virgil's made a decision to stop that from happening. I don't see anything wrong with that. The problem is, is that when you do a pay-per-view fight, you're always up against it um, from the fans. People are paying a lot more money than they do normally, so they want blood. They want to see the clinical ending. They want to see the knockout. And I think with Amir Khan, that's what, I say that's what he does, but that's what, you know, he's in unbelievable fights. He's been knocked out before. People were watching that fight going, I think Amir's going to get knocked out in a minute. And they wanted to see that. He got hit very low. And I just think it was a timing thing where Virgil sort of looked at Amir and felt, does he really want to continue? I don't think so. Um, I, but I don't, I don't believe, you know, people say that Amir's a coward. He's not a coward. You know, he's a brave guy. He's fought the best. And if you watch the fight back, like in that round, he was doing quite well. He was jumping in. And I was almost watching it going, oh, because he kept, he leaps in. Oh, 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 oh. You know, and he puts himself at risk, but that's what people like. So to see it end like that, when people have paid all that money, it's not good news for the show in general. But that's a problem. You know, I feel it when I do a pay-per-view show. You're almost praying that it's a great fight or you know, it's a clinical ending because you, want, you don't want people to start moaning. And that's what they're going to do, especially when they're having to fork out all that money. With, Amir, with that ending, does a Kell Brook, Amir Khan fight... I guess still, maybe not salvageable is the word, it's but still, still have it's interest. Not, it's not as big. It's not as big. But I think Kel might fight Crawford. I mean, that seems to be the fight that he wants at the moment. Um, I don't think that Kel really wants the market time fights anymore. He just wants to jump in into the biggest fights possible. But, you know, Crawford's going to want the big fights, the big, big fights. But it's very difficult for top rank to deliver those big fights. Kel Brook, you mentioned, uh, would he be coming down to welterweight to he fight He would Kel do Brook? to fight Crawford. It's not... It's not ideal for him. I mean, he can do it, but, you know, really, I believe he's, he's kind of stuck in the middle, to be honest with you. But it's hard for him to make 147. Hard. But if he's got enough time, he can do it. Today, we just learned that Gennady left his longtime yes. trainer, Abel. You, you just found out, Chris too? Mannix told me just when I finished that interview, yeah. What did uh, you think when he told you? I was quite surprised. I mean, was he in New York with him? Uh, no. 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 He just made an IG post about it and said it's a personal decision and a career-wise decision. I saw, I saw Abel's quotes from Chris Mannix. He oh, said it was about money. money. Yeah, I think so. It was about what? Money? Money. Money, money between who? Abel and Gennady. That's, oh, wow. that's what Abel said. I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't like to get involved. Yeah, he's involved. Yeah, I mean, look, when we had, the, you know, we had, we had meetings, me and John Skipper with Gennady and his team and Tom and... You know, Tom's, Tom's definitely involved. You saw him in the presser, you know. Yeah. Doing his thing. But Gennady's definitely steering the ship. Um, I don't know what's happened with him and Abel. You know, it's a strange time to change trainers. But, you know, if he feels like he's going to be better, it doesn't sound like it was a technical thing or it was a improvement thing. It was obviously just a dispute about something, maybe a deal or something like that. Eddie, leaving a trainer at 37 years old. Yeah, it's not. But, you know, I said earlier in that interview is... Just because you're 37 and just because you've only got five or six fights left doesn't mean you can't stop trying to improve or be the best. So if you feel like you can improve with another trainer, I've seen so many fighters in the past stay with a trainer for that exact reason. Yeah, but you know, he's been good. To, I'm at the end now, I've only got, I'll just stay. Where really, who knows what a new trainer could have, could have brought to their career. So um, it surprised me though, because I thought those two were ultra tight. You know? Who could be his trainer? Good question. There's a lot of good trainers in America. There's a lot. There's a lot of understated trainers. I mean, there's there's a trainer called Shadid Saluki. Most of you may not have even heard of him. No. But he trains Anthony Sims Jr. He trains Mike Perez. He trained trained Lamont Brewster. Um, you know, he's, he's like there's a lot of 
guys that don't like the limelight that you don't really get to know about because they're not putting themselves out there. Um, like a Buddy McGirt or something. Yeah, Buddy McGirt is a good trainer. Um, Does, does Danny Jacobs trains a great trainer. Uh, John Baby Jackson, Freddie Roach. You know, there's loads of guys. But um, it's, it's a preference thing, isn't it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, he's going to want to stay in LA, I think, with his family set up. So. Abel seemed to be a big kind of mouthpiece, almost a promoter as well yeah, for, was, for yeah, Triple yeah, yeah. G. I mean, I feel like that might have some effect as well on, on Triple G as well, would you think? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, they're all questions for Triple G. We can only speculate. I wouldn't like to say something that would upset someone, especially not Bernardi. No. I like him a lot. No, but he's, you know, he's he's a very classy guy, so it's his business, and it's just, I don't know, sad, really, because they were a great team. Can you speak about the recent selection of the um, Canelo Jacob judges? I think it was um, one judge from the first fight, the Canelo Rocky fight. Steve Wisefield, Glenn Feldman, and uh, Moretti. Yeah. So, um, I mean, they. I believe it's the same panel as the last fight, actually. Yeah, identity. yeah, it's a rematch, yeah. Yeah, to be honest with you, they're three outstanding judges, and we're very happy with that selection. I mean, Glenn Feldman is an outstanding judge. Steve Wisefield is an outstanding judge, and so is so is Moretti. So, although they might have given a score in the first fight that some didn't agree with, I completely 100% trust those guys to do the right thing and make sure Danny Jacobs wins that fight by any means possible. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah. no I, just, I, just, I just think they're really good honest judges and I you know I stand by that and you know after the fire um, if it go if, if there's a controversial decision I don't have any like any feeling that anything until I mean I don't get that feeling anyway like people talk about oh boxing's corrupt it's just, like I can tell you I, I think I'd know and it's not but Hometown fighters, big name fighters, do sometimes get the rubber of the green. But sometimes it can work the other way. You know, maybe this is a close fight. Maybe they give it to Danny Jacobs this time around. But I, I know those three judges are honest people, and I expect them to make the right decision next Saturday. Just having now experienced the United States um, boxing platform and scenery, um, do, do you, how much do you, do you feel corruption is, is in play at all? Like ever? No, no. I mean, look, this is a different market. I think you've got a, a more of a ped problem than the UK boxing. In the United States, is yeah, more of a sure. Than there's, the there's no testing. There's no testing at all. You know, outside of big fights, as in, you know, the main fights having VADA testing. Generally, there's no testing. You're completely left to your own devices. So a lot of these kids coming through right now, they don't get tested. So how do we know? Look at Jarrell Miller. Jarrell Miller signed up for VADA testing. Like, to a program where he knew he was going to get tested every week, maybe every day. And he failed three different substances. That was a guy who knew he was being VADA tested. What about if you know you're definitely not, and it's not you might get tested, you might not. It's just you definitely won't get tested. Apart from on the night, which is a complete joke, a complete waste of time. So I think, I think, and in, in the UK, British Boxing Board of Control has every fighter signed up to UCAD for random testing. You're not going to get as tested as often as you are under the VADA program that we do for big fights. But at least you've got the fear. I mean, hopefully that's enough to deter people. But then Jarrell Miller had the fear. You know, and look what he did. But I just think that, um, going back to corruption, no, I, I don't, you know, you know I, I, don't, I don't believe, I don't believe in that. I, I've, I've never seen it. Um, I don't believe it exists. But the ped thing, I think, is a major problem. And I think people have got to act. Points that there's a bigger pets, um, it's just a truth. I'm not here to win brownie yeah. points, I'm just telling you the truth. Of course there's going to be a bigger problem because it's about 10 times the size of the UK. I don't know how much bigger is, but there's no testing. So of course there's going to be a bigger problem. Is that something that you plan on changing? Which trying, areas? but I don't really know what the answer is. It's very expensive. You know, you're talking about $40,000 a fight to get tested properly in a way that you should be tested. So well, you can't do that through the whole bill. But we try for every main fire to have VADA testing in place. But every promoter's got to do it. And some fighters don't want to sign up to VADA. You know, some type, I'm not talking about, I mean the WBC do a good job, you know, but it's not, like I've got a lot of fighters that are with the WBC that are on the VADA list that have never been tested. 
So the only way to do it really is to pay for what we do on the big fires, which is every week, sometimes twice a day, or three times in two days, you just don't know. It's the only way, you can't escape. But think of all the fires in the US, how many are being tested? I don't know, 10%? Like, it's frightening. With uh, the rise of streaming, obviously, you know, you were uh, jumped on that uh, wagon quickly with the zone. Uh, but now we see like Disney Plus, Apple Plus, others, you know, bigger companies, you know, entering the streaming field. Uh, how do you feel about the zone moving up their price more to twenty dollars? How do you feel about it competing with ESPN Plus, obviously owned by Disney, uh, and them opening their own streaming platform? You know, how do you feel about the competition right now in the streaming world? Uh, I think it's great for the content providers like us 